Hey, thanks for checking out the Nikhil Hogan Show. If you like the content, you can subscribe to it on most major podcast platforms, YouTube or Facebook. I'm also writing a book on music education called Why Children Quit Music. And you can check out my website, NikhilHogan.com, for updates on when it's going to be released. If you're a parent who's interested in learning how best to help your children learn music, you can check out my company, SongbirdMusicAcademy.com. And there are a ton of free articles links and resources for Neapolitan Partimento-based learning, and also the Barry Harris Method if you're interested in learning jazz. Now, let's get to the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show, the music interview show bringing in-depth music conversations with some of the world's best musicians. I'm so thrilled to talk to my guest today, three-time Grammy-nominated jazz singer and seven-time Emmy-nominated lyricist Lorraine Feather. As an artist, she has recorded 12 albums. Her 2010 release, Ages, featured songs with her lyrics and music by Eddie Arkin, Shelley Berg, Russell Ferrante, Dick Hyman, and Bella Fleck. It brought Lorraine her first Grammy. Grammy nomination in 2011 in the Best Jazz Vocal Album category. In 2013, her album Attachments was nominated for the Grammy for Best Jazz Vocal Album as well. And again, in 2015, her album Flirting with Disaster was also nominated for the Grammy for Best Jazz Vocal Album. Uh, Lorraine has also received seven Emmy nominations writing for television. Some of her credits include Disney's Dinosaurs, Pooh's Heffalump Halloween, PBS's Make Way for Naughty, the MGM animated film Babes in Toyland, Hasbro's My Little Pony series, and some of the film work she's done includes The Jungle Book 2, The Princess Diaries 2, All Dogs Go to Heaven, The Lion Hearts, and much more. Her latest album is 2018's Math Camp. It was produced with longtime co-writer Eddie Arkin, with seven of the songs written by Arkin and three with Shelley Burke. Hey, Lorraine, welcome to the show. Hey, Nikhil, that was a fantastic introduction. It was comprehensive <laughs> beyond belief. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you like the questions, too. Let me, let me get right started with this question. You grew up in L.A. You mentioned a vivid memory of listening to the record player. And this is what you said. I remember listening to an album by Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross called The Hottest Group in Jazz before I remember hearing anything else. My mother and I would listen and try and sing along to Monin, Centerpiece, and Twisted. Could you describe some of the records that you grew up listening to that were very, very influential in your development? Sure. Well, I was born in New York, and I lived there until I was 12 with my parents, and then we moved to L.A. So we were... At, when I was born, my parents were living at One Sheridan Square, which was, they were right upstairs from Cafe Society downtown, which they called, of course, Cafe Society downstairs. And then when I was one, they moved to Riverside Drive and what's now called Duke Ellington Boulevard to a, a Riverview apartment that I'm sure is just unbelievably expensive now. <laughs> right. But I heard jazz constantly of course when I was a kid and jazz musicians would call I remember listening to that hottest new group and I'm not sure how old I was what year it came out but but my mom and I would would sing along she was a singer had been a singer her roommate was Peggy Lee Peggy was Aunt Peggy to me and my godmother was Billie Holiday so I was completely saturated <laughs> with jazz from an early age but we we loved that music and since you're 1960 that album 1960. That's really weird because I, I must have been. What, when was the earliest Lambert Hendricks and Ross album? Uh, okay, they were formed 1957, and their first 1957. record was "Sing a Song of Basie." That's 1957. Was. All right, so I, I have it a bit scrambled up because I would still have been in New York for the the first album, and I, I do remember listening to it in in my parents in my parents' room. And I was just completely bewitched by their harmonies and their swing and their lyrics. I, I never would have thought that lyric writing would turn out to be the, the center of my, my creative life. Or did I even think I would have a creative life? I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't sing. I didn't think I had much of a voice when I was growing up. But... As I said, jazz musicians were in and out of the place all the time. Billie Holiday and Bobby Short sang in the living room at cocktail <laughs> parties when I was in the bedroom with my grandma falling asleep. And 
it was just it was all around me. I mean, that is astonishing. I mean, I mean, I went to Berkeley, and the way we are taught music history, it's like these are godlike figures. Only, you know? so it's kind of amazing just to hear that. Well, it is, it, and I I didn't know that it was anything other than normal. I remember asking my mom when I went to grade school one day. I came home and I said, what is it that daddy does? Because everybody was <laughs> was uh, talking about their parents' professions. And she said, he is a jazz writer. I went, uh, okay. I didn't even know what that was. Or even that it was a thing, a, a profession of any kind, which it almost was not. He just, he moved from England because he had heard a Louis Armstrong piece called West End Blues on the West End, and he just became electrified. It changed his entire life. So John Hammond met him out at the boat. My dad was really young, and he just dove into head first into the world of jazz, and it was one of those uh, synchronicity type things. Everything was going on then. All of the, the great singers with the classic voices and the great American songbook songs were being written it was it was quite something growing up were you an avid reader and 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 this is non-musical but did you read a lot and did you write uh, your your father wrote i mean he he wrote lyrics actually you mentioned that he made more of a living as a songwriter mm -hmm. than he did writing columns or books that's true and mostly blues ly lyrics and some of them kind of on the dirty side <laughs> i don't know where, where it came from but but did you uh, I, did, I did you write, write did you write as a child and did you read a lot as well yes i i did write and read i was a, a poor student i honestly i'm not proud of this but i can't even remember a lot of my childhood it's it's like i was kind of on another planet or something <laughs> I was just in my own world, but I did I did read a lot, and I wrote little poems. Um, the first one was entitled "The Ocean of Death," right? And it was about <laughs> skulls being washed up on the wow. shore. I, How old obviously, were you? I was I don't know <laughs> <laughs> six or eight or something. <laughs> but um, I, I did write poetry, and I remember getting I, I got a prize later for writing an essay about something. So that's what I mean. I literally, I can't remember what it was about. Lorraine, did your father encourage you to write did, or did it just happen spontaneously? You got the bug, you started writing. I know you wanted to be an actress later, but, but, but when you were younger, did you did you? Yeah, well, what happened write? was my father encouraged me. I didn't want to write. I didn't really think about writing as a, as a profession. My dad gave me piano lessons with John Lewis, the famous John Lewis. Wow. And... To my everlasting regret, I just didn't pay attention and I, I didn't practice. And he was very kind. But at a certain point, I think, told my dad, you know, she's she's not really in, uh, into this. So <laughs> I, I think we should should stop. I then took lessons with John Mahegan, who wrote a lot of famous um, music books. And again, I, I just, I think because my parents wanted me to, maybe he should have told me, do not under any circumstances touch the piano. And I would have done it. But that's just, that's just the way it happened. And then we moved out to LA. I was pretty unhappy out there. I went to a Wait Catholic a second, school. Lorraine, can I just take a step back? You mentioned John Mahegan, right? And uh, yeah. I, I remember he's kind of a genius, isn't he? He's like a kind of a brilliant, brilliant musician. Uh, he, he worked with Leonard Bernstein. He was yes. a jazz pianist. Could you talk a little bit about that? I, I just want to touch on that a little bit. What was that like with John Mahegan? All I remember was that he was, a, he was also a very nice guy and brainy. And um, I believe he had a lot of Peanuts comic strips around the house. <laughs> okay. But I, I, I don't remember much about him, except that he, he too tried to teach me piano the same way I don't remember much about the musicians who came in in and out of the house like Dizzy Gillespie he was a, he was a close friend of my folks and all I remember was that he was a great guy with a big smile and a <laughs> wonderful sense of humor he had a wife who was also Lorraine who gave me a pen a ballerina pen with little pearls on it that I lost the way I lost everything but I, I just remember these people sort of vaguely also Dick Hyman with whom I became friends many decades later on my own. I just, uh, I, I just kind of knew them in passing, right? How much did you write as a child? Not that much. 
I, I, I did it for a while and then it, it, it sort of passed. But I remember seeing a letter from, I went to an Episcopalian school. It was rather high Episcopalian. They had nuns in full, full on habits. And my dad sent some of my poems to the principal and she said, well, she's very, very gifted, obviously. And uh, we've had her tested recently and we're really at a loss as to why she's such a poor student. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <laughs> that, that's how that, that happened. But no, I, I, I didn't write a lot. And then when we, we, we moved to California, I didn't like it there. Uh, I've never cared for the heat and it, we were, it's, it's isolating living in a house in California and not being able to walk or, or, you know, see water or where I was or anything. But I, because I had a friend who was in this Catholic school, I went for one year. And during that time, there was an all-girl production of uh, Electra. I forget if it was by Euripides or who it was, but it you know, a, one of those Greek guys. And the lead got sick and had to drop out. And I always had a talent for memorization. So I said, oh, I think I can memorize the lines and, and just do this right away. And... When we did it, I got through the show and my class stood up and applauded me. And I had never been particularly popular or anything. So it was exciting. I thought, well, I'm going to be an actress. That's what I'm going to do. Then after leaving Catholic school, which didn't suit me particularly, I went to Hollywood High, a public school, for, for the end of my, my school career and participated in a lot of after hours drama activity. There were people there who went on to be in TV shows like Barbara Hershey, who was Barbara Hershey at the time, Meredith Baxter, who later became Meredith Baxter Bernie, John Ritter, student body president. And I, I did well and I, I made friends and I, I won a couple of little awards. And then I went to LA City College, which was also a, a theater arts place of, of note in in uh, Los Angeles. And I thought, okay, so now I'm going to go back to New York and I'm going to be an actress. I was 18 at the time. I got a, a mini scholarship to study at a place called Circle in the Square. And I went back there and, or, oh no, I was 17. And as soon as I became 18, I announced to my parents that I'd be moving. I was going to stay in New York and I got a waitressing job at the Village Gate. So I, I tried to be an actress. One of my friends from L.A. City College came back and, and roomed with me. And I, we would go to every audition. And it, it just became immediately very stressful and seemingly impossible to get a job without an agent. There were so many actors in, in New York. I did do, I did an off-Broadway show. I was in Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway for a while and on tour, you know, just as a, as a leper and a, a chorus person. You have a great voice. I mean, did you ever take singing lessons? No, I did not. I, I never thought I had a good voice because I had a very distinct break between my ranges. So when I tried out for choir and they said, sing a scale... I would break right in the middle and people would laugh and go, oh, I have a terrible voice. And it wasn't until I had been out of work acting for some time and just began singing to make a few bucks because I had a, a good ear and I did have a, a nice instrument that I sang regularly. And then it wasn't until I, I started doing performances on my own that somebody recommended to me through a mutual friend that I study to, to, to deal with what she could tell was a problem with my break. So I took from someone who was from the Ron Anderson school. I mean, not Ron Anderson school. The guy's name was Ron Anderson. The Seth Riggs school. He's very famous. The speech level vocal singing. teacher, speech level singing. And I still use those uh, recordings. So it, it helped me greatly. When did you start writing lyrics to songs? When I started writing lyrics to songs was when I, when my late twenties, when I was still doing top 40, but at the time I was trying to write pop lyrics, something commercial, and it didn't, didn't particularly take off when I, um, 
I was living uh, in Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles then, and I was still working part time. I was selling stuff over the phone, which I found that I, I was better at than, than waitressing. And I, I got a call out of the blue from another singer who said, I just auditioned for something. And I told them, I'm the wrong person for this, but I have the perfect person for you. And it was, it was uh, for a group called Swing. It was conceived by the pop producer, Richard Perry, and the movie producer, Joel Silver, who were friends. And they had the idea to put a vocal trio together in front of a big band and have it be kind of a nouveau big band thing. I got that job. The two other people at the time were Charlotte Crossley, whom I knew from Jesus Christ Superstar and who used to be a harlot with Bette Midler, and Steve March, now Steve March Torme, Mel Torme's son. The band Full Swing, which you just mentioned, with Richard Perry, you submitted some lyrics to him, right? And he initially didn't like them, but then after you rewrote them, he he accepted them. And then you wrote the lyrics for like half the tunes on the album. Yeah, that's what happened. I went with them to a, a jazz club at the time, Dante's, and we heard Tommy Newsom's big band, Tommy Newsom, who was on The Tonight Show. And Richard said, I like that tune of his. It was called La, La Bem. And he said, I, I think we should get a lyricist to write lyrics. I went, oh, maybe I could do that. Because it was similar to what I had heard when I was a kid, kind of tricky, challenging melody. How did you tackle that that first album for Full Swing? And, and how, do you remember that process? And how long did it take for you to write those first lyrics that you submitted to Richard Perry? Not long. And that's <clears throat> that's the weird thing. I had been at this point, I had been stumbling around trying to fashion some kind of performance career for myself for a, quite a while. And all of a sudden, it just it just came came uh, to be that I was able to do something without almost even thinking about it. I'm not saying that it's not difficult because because it is, but it just was so natural to me. And I don't know where it came from. You could say that it was genetic or it was because I heard all of those, those great American songbook songs by osmosis, but it, it's, it just seemed to come out of nowhere. And as soon as I began doing it, it became the most satisfying thing in my creative life. And I, I became obsessed by it. And I found eventually, it took me a, really a few more years, but that was how I kind of found my voice as a singer. How I liked to sing was when I began singing my own lyrics. And also on stage, I had been really nervous on stage. I didn't know what to say <laughs> to the audience. <laughs> and when I began doing my own songs, my um, my then husband, Tony Morales, said to me after we did this first gig in, in which I performed a song, various songs with my lyrics, he said, geez, he said, you got up to the microphone. It was like you couldn't shut you up. I said, I know. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I loved talking to the audience. When you wrote that album for Full Swing, what did he not like and how did you change? What were you changing? What were the notes that he gave you to those lyrics that you initially gave him? The first lyric I wrote was called My Baby Knows How to Swing or Loves How to Swing or something like that. And I can't remember what the lyrics were, but it was kind of about a person. And he said, well, I don't like this. He said, here's what you, sh what you should write about. He said, you should write about a ballroom where people go and it's very sophisticated and it's very high level and they're doing drugs. I'm not really proud <laughs> of including drugs in my song, but it was the 80s and and that's that's what he said. And they're they're just having the best time of their lives at this imaginary ballroom. So I decided to call it the Trocadero Ballroom. And I do, as a matter of fact, remember some of what I did in the process of writing that song was that I shopped around f for the name of the ballroom, like da 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 I, I just took the number of syllables and I just went, this was before everybody was on the internet, of course. But I, I just looked around for something 
that would seem to fit that was the right right number of I didn't say amount of syllables because it's number not amount <laughs> but um, I I I did that and 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 just kind of shifted the pieces of the puzzle around because that that's what a song is it's a puzzle and there's um, quite a bit of math in it because you're you're dealing with rhythm and and rhyme especially when you're writing to something that was never intended to be a vocal tune at all. Did you, uh, because you did vocal lessons you mentioned, but did you take any music theory lessons to understand like, uh, or did you look at scores to see how writers would, or lyricists would put certain notes along with syllables or, you know, they would extend a syllable with many notes. Did you take any, did you do any kind of that research? I'm amazed at how natural you are. Uh, Oh, thank you. No, I didn't. I don't read. Uh, I, I read to the extent that if you showed me a piece of music, I'd know what key it was in just by counting the flats or sharps. And I've apologized to my co-writers over the years, over and over and over again. And finally, not that many years ago, I was working with Dave Grusin and I I did my usual apology. I said, (laughs) I'm really sorry, but I, I, I don't read. And he said, that's okay, Lorraine, you hear your first project, The Body Remembers, was released in 97 on the Beanbag label. It was an electronic album, and it had various co-writers like Tony Morales, uh, Terry Sampson, Joe Curiali, Yutaka, uh, 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 Don Grusin, Eddie Arkin. Uh, I'm quite an admirer of the great Joseph Curiali. Could you tell me more about that project and how it came about where you were taking the reins and you were making your own music? Well, what happened was <clears throat> that I had been with Full Swing for for uh, some years. It had changed personnel a couple of times. And I honestly didn't think I had anything to offer on my own as a soloist. Like, well, what would I do just standing up there by myself? And I just suddenly one day had an epiphany. And I thought, you know, that's not true. I, I think I do have something to offer as a solo artist. And I'm just going to give it a go. So I I leapt into that album and I was at the time married to Tony, who was a drummer and also very creative. He had a lot of kooky ideas. He he had this um, this uh, bass machine. You know, that was in the time of the TX four track and and all of these these drum machines and bass machines. I think it was called a bass man. The battery started to go low, and it began making these noises like, (laughs) and he said, listen to this. I kind of changed it a little bit, and I I programmed it. He said, isn't it cool the noises make me? He said, you could, I I think, I don't know if if I had the idea first or he did, but he's the one who counted it for him. He said it. Look, you could say, I can count to five, 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 over this. And he was working at the time for Ricky Lee Jones and said that her her little girl pointed to some people in the room when they were all together and went, one, two, three, four, five. So I, I wrote that song, Five, with Tony. I just came up with, with a melody, and we just did it in our our garage in La Crescenta, California, that he had soundproofed to be his, his practice room. And he had his um, four track and eight track in. And I just, just did it. And I also did this talking thing, which again, like lyric writing itself, just it seemed to come from outer space. I don't know why I started talking when the track was playing, but I did. And I incorporated that into other songs on the album um, I, I don't remember. I'm, I think that Joe probably remembers where we met, but I, I don't. At the time, a lot, a, a lot of the time, a musician would introduce you to another musician or a songwriter to another songwriter. But these are, these are the people in my world. Don Grusin, who helped me a lot as a singer also when I was first recording. And... Um, and Tony and Terry Sampson, who later went on to write some of the, the kids' music with me for Naughty. It just kind of developed. I'd really love to get into the, your thinking process when you're writing these, these, these songs, these great songs. So what is the Lorraine Feather method 
to lyric writing? Do you have a, I mean, do you have a personal technique that you employ? What's your thought process? What comes first, lyrics or melody? Uh, how do you think? It changed because what I did after there was a little break after I did that album. And then I began listening to this Fats Waller music. After my dad passed away, I was going through uh, through um, CDs that my mother had. And I, I became absolutely smitten with Fats Waller, who died before I was even born. And when I was a kid, it was already old fashioned to my parents who uh, were devoted to bebop already. So I hadn't heard much of it. And I thought, God, what if I could write lyrics to? I, I was just casting about for something to do. I was, was writing lyrics for animation with Mark Waters, who's now teaches at Eastman, where I live in Rochester. It's a very good friend of mine and a wonderful composer. But I, I didn't have a lot of work, and I just wanted to do something interesting and difficult. So I wrote lyrics to this Fats Waller tune. I sent it to Dick Hyman, who was not a personal friend of mine, but had known my parents so well. And he, he, um, he called and he said, Lorraine, you should do a whole album of these Fats Waller tunes, and I will play on it. He was, he's soft spoken, but very, you know, definite in his opinions. Like you're going to do this now. So I said, okay. He said, it's kind of like Lambert Hendricks and Ross, only the music is even much older. <laughs> um, so that's a different process. I so that's was music in, first and then that's lyrics. That's music like, first. So take that, if we could take that album just as an example there's so many great tunes on that, like Smashing Thirds, which is Cezanne based on Smashing Thirds. Now, That's the first one I wrote, yeah. How would you tackle doing something like that? Um, what I would do was just listen to the song endlessly and wait until words came to mind. And sometimes they would be in the middle of the song. Often it would be just a phrase in the middle of the song. And I'd go, oh, I know it. it it should be it should be like but a no for an answer. And it was Dick Hyman who, after I sent it to him, said, by the way, you need to call that song Cezanne so that people can be in on the joke because they have no idea what you're singing about until the very end. I went, OK, so uh, I would just uh, kind of do, uh, recite in many cases gibberish to myself. We were living in northern California in a hill town called El Granada. And I would walk up and down the streets just listening to this music and just kind of gibbering or drive around in my little Volkswagen Beetle with the um, CD changer in the back and, and uh, just sing to myself. And the, the song would kind of, the lyrics would kind of emerge a, a little at a time. And then the technical part comes in like, oh, okay. So if I say this here, then I may want to restate it in the next section. Uh, it, it, again, it's not like I ever went to class for this. It just sort of existed somehow. How long would it take you to do, like, for instance, one of the Fats Waller tunes? Would it take uh, a week, a day? Yeah. Well, never a day. Uh, usually a week, I would say. How do you make sense of the free association that you come up with? Well, there is a certain st structure of songs. Uh, old time songs used to be with the hook at the end of the section, like Angel Eyes. For example, a pop song was like verse, first chorus usually. And I would generally tend toward the old time structure. But sometimes you'd have an A section, a B section, and maybe there's another section that you might want to do. And with those old songs, sometimes, and I found this later when I did my second stride album, which was with Stephanie Tripp as our a duo nouveau stride sometimes the it, the lyrics are unsingable so you have to come up with a, a counter melody they just don't sound good even if i could do them even if i could sing them it's just not a, a great idea <laughs> so then you come up with a counter melody that that goes along with it when's the best time of day for you to write personally are you a night owl or are you a morning person i have to start a song fairly early in the day. And then once I have the momentum going, it stays with me. I, I might wake up in the middle of the night. I used to keep a pen and paper by my bed. Now, naturally, it's my phone and I have a little recording 
device. But I, I think a lot of the time when I'm out walking, the same as when I, I did those Fats Waller things, the, the way I describe working on that, when I'm out walking, I'll think of a background vocal or a, a better way to say something. And then what I've found the mysterious secret about writing is that if you if you wanted to do perfect rhymes, which I I do, many times the line that makes the most sense is also a perfect rhyme. It's kind of um it's kind of eerie. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the type to rewrite a lot? I rewrite a lot while the song is going on, but once it's done, I I don't look back on it and go, gee, I recorded that and I never liked that second verse. I I, I just kind of leave it be once once it's done. Then the business of singing singing it comes into play. Choosing a musician to co-write with, because you write with some really great musicians, Eddie Arkin, with your latest album, Math Camp. What do you look for in a co-writer, and what are the things that you, what qualities are important to you when, when, when it comes to the compositional and writing process? It's somewhat intuitive. I, I met Eddie in the 80s through a mutual writer friend. And we began working on some stuff together for full swing, but it's it's gotten it's evolved over the years. And at this point, when I sit with Eddie in a room, it's it's as if we are inhabiting one mind. I, I met Russell and started working with Russell later at, on the Cafe Society album, but it's it's similar. I also see him far less than I do Eddie or talk to him. He's on the road with Yellow Jackets all the time. And I, I talk to Eddie pretty, pretty well constantly. There was a period during which he was working for TV and he was busy all the time. But now, sometimes a few days will go by when he's, he's busy, but I, I just talk to him all the time. Yet it's, it's similar. We just have a chemistry. I, I don't remember, say, looking for a co-writer per se. It just happened. It was Shelley Berg also. The way I met Shelley was that I had this Fats Waller album that had gotten some good reviews and radio play. And I had a gig to perform it and nobody to play the music. And one person after another turned me down. They said, well, I don't play stride or I'm not going to learn to play stride. And Shelley, who was, uh, we were both li living in California at the time. And he was at USC said, yeah, I think I can put this together. <laughs> so he practiced and he said he just tortured his wife because he would <laughs> he would hit the wrong note on the left hand over and over. And we did a gig at what was the old Catalina's in L.A. And it, it, it came out great. And then in the course of working together, performing together over the next few years, we began writing together. And I found that he was all also a simpatico collaborator, very, very fast. I've never known anyone who would just come up with something instantaneously the way Shelley, Shelley did. Be My Muse from the, what album was that from? Attachments? Flirting with Noah's, I think it was Flirting with Disaster. He got a, an arrangement nomination for that. And I, I remember sitting with him at the piano and going, could you do some kind of a classical thing at the beginning that's not exactly, and he goes, -l 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 -l. he immediately <laughs> came up with yep. it, immediately. So that's that's the way he is. And again, I never talk to, to Shelley or see him practically. He now teaches, uh, he runs the Frost School of Music at the University of Miami. And we, we never talk until I go, hey, Shelley, can we get together and write something? Last time for math camp, I said, are you going to be in New York at any point? And he told me, yeah, I'm going to be playing at, at Lincoln Center, and I think I could get uh, the piano for us there. So we, we were able to get a piano for two days, and we wrote two songs, and then he wrote the third one, in my absence, some kind of Einstein. And that was it. How do you deal with writer's block? I, I hate to say this because it's like a major jinx, but I don't really experience that. What I what I do happen have happen is that sometimes I can't I, I can't figure out what I want to do or when 
one of my co-writers and I are together, we do something in particular with, with Eddie. We'll, we'll go over something and, and we might have a day where we go, he'll, he'll, he's usually the one who will nah, I don't like it. We we should start off. And, and I, I can't remember any time when it happened two days in a row. It's usually just one. Let's talk about Math Camp, which is your most recent album. And, uh, you were collaborating with Eddie Arkin, and um, and I'd love to know how a typical writing session would go. It's like, for instance, like I don't mean to make a big deal of it, taking that track. How would you start that, and how long would it take to write a song like that? And tell me the writing process. I don't remember the precise sequence of events, but Eddie was Eddie is a, a very good guitar player. He wrote a, a well known guitar, course called a book called. Creative Chord Substitutions for Jazz Guitar, I think. I'm not positive that's the, that's the title, but something like that. But he, he started playing more, and he was coming up with more gu- guitar ideas, which was less typical for our songs. And uh, what I do is I, I give him an entire lyric. And in this case, it was an entire lyric with three talking sections so you write it without any music beforehand right so in the case of i don't mean to make a big deal of it i if it's an up tempo tune i need to have a groove of some kind right so eddie will help me with that in this case tony by then my my ex-husband i was visiting him and he was living in an apartment and he had these rubber baffles on his drums so that he could practice without disturbing anybody and he was playing this groove that I really liked. It was kind of jungly. And I said, oh, Tony, Tony, please, can I record that? So I did. And Eddie made a loop of it. Usually I'll say, could you make a loop of this for five minutes? So he, ma- he made a loop of it. And I then wrote the, the lyrics. And I said, well, this would be the talking sections. And I believe, although Eddie would probably remember better than I, I think that I suggested that the background vocals, which I love doing, I, I, I like layering my voice and doing harmonies, it's fun. But I said, I think the background, have, have, they should be different each time. And so he came, came up with these really interesting ideas where there would be sometimes a pad of background vocals, or sometimes it would go ooh, 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 and different lengths of space in between the oohs. And so we put it together and he came up with this uh, this guitar line that is kind of a cross between Twin Peaks and some sort of famous jazz guitarist. And um, it, it just evolved. And he, he has a full on studio in his house and Eddie does great demos. So that's what we, we play for the musicians. Now, how long did it take to write all the tunes in Math Camp? It's hard to say because I don't do them all at once. I, I since I I produce these albums myself, I can't afford to go in and do the whole thing all at once anyway. But I rather like the process of doing a few and then seeing what I have and then doing the next few. So it was it was a longer break than <clears throat> than usual doing Math Camp because I I moved at one point and I just I I just wasn't spending as much time writing for a while, but. I don't know, maybe a, a year and a half on and off. The, the writing itself, though, especially since I wasn't living in L.A. for a, a lot of this, I would just go to Eddie's and we would get together for two days or, or three days. And, and I would say that in a day, we usually come up with, we can come up with most of one song and maybe the beginning of, of the next what are the things that are important to you craft-wise in a song? For instance, like rhyming you mentioned. What are the things that get you excited in the product of producing some writing? Are there, what are the little things that, that you are very meticulous about? I, I like it to feel good and not have the, the emphasis be on, on a bad syllable. I, I, I want the, the high notes not to sound bad in that range, of course. And I, I always get a out of it when I can put a word in a song 
or a phrase in a song that I don't think has been used <laughs> in a song before. Like uh, in I, we appreciate your patience with Shelley Berg. I, I like the phrase customer care representative because it's it's saying well. And uh, I was pretty sure it hadn't been utilized by another <laughs> another lyricist. So I, I get a kick out of that, but I don't try and do it gratuitously. It just it just sort of happens. If you could compare yourself maybe 10, 20 years ago to your writing style now and your development, what things have changed in your writing style that you've noticed uh, over your career? I would say that my writing has become a lot more personal for one thing, although I don't, I, I don't consider my songs a diary. I don't know if it's just self-protection or it's just natural for me, but also it's a case of having more freedom. I don't feel that I need to describe an event that happened in my life very specifically. It's a, it's a, a mishmash of things that have happened to me, things that have happened to people I know, uh, novels, films, some little anecdote that a, a friend told me you, that I might tuck away for years and then it just a, appears in a song. But I, I think that I've just, I, I've gotten better at finding ways to put emotion in, in a song and humor. Sometimes it's something very sad and funny at the same time. It's just, I, I believe that the, the songs are deeper that way than they were when I was 20 or 30 or 40. What was the most difficult song for you to write? And this could be a technical reason or it could also be just a, a narrative reason. Uh, what, 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 what song in your, uh, in your work have you found that, wow, that was a tough song to write? I would say the hardest song to write that well there were some that were technically the, the Fats Waller songs or the Duke Ellington, Ellington songs technically extremely hard hard to write Indiana Lana which was Jubilee Stomp was the hardest technically to write because I couldn't think of a title and I would literally lie awake just uh, you know chattering to myself so that was the hardest technically the hardest mentally was a song I wrote called The Veil and what happened was that I was I was writing this uh, the songs for this album, attachments, and my friend Alex Shapiro, who was I called her my island sister for a while because she she still lives on San Juan Island in the in the San Juans of Washington State, and then I was living on Orcas and I used to visit her. But she said to me one day, "You know, Lorraine, you've never written a song about your mother," and I. I I realized that if I did, it would be difficult because I, I love my mom very much, but our relationship was hard. And I, I don't like to talk about it in too much detail because there are still people alive who knew her and I, I don't want to put it on them in a way, but she had some, some very serious problems and um, it, it was heavy. You know, she was, we had, had trouble communicating from the very second I moved back to New York until the rest of my life. She just, um, I don't know. I, I Again, I, I, I don't want to get too deeply into it. I, I had um, somebody, in fact, it was, was it Russell's? I, I, no, because he actually knew the story. But s several people thought that the story was about my mom having Alzheimer's, and that was not what it was about. But... Um, it was really difficult because it was so upsetting for me. And uh, after I finished it, I sent it to Alex before the album was out. And she she said, wrote me and she said, well, here I am trying to do my composing work, sitting at my my computer, and I've just been sobbing my guts out. On the flip side, what was the easiest song for you to write? Um, hmm. Well... I always had a thing for you, which I wrote with Shelley Berg was pretty easy. It didn't have a lot of words. It was a simple, uh, a simple um, concept. And we wrote it at a sound check at Nighttown in Cleveland with cl dishes clanking in the background. 
and the waitress is yelling about how many reservations they had, <laughs> which were not as many as they we had hoped for. <laughs> and we, we wrote um, a couple of songs during that, that sound check, one of which was I Forgot to Have Children, which is not easy, and yet we did it fast. But then I Always Had a Thing for You, which was uh, kind of in the old standard mode and uh, was was pretty simple. In fact, I thanked Warren Beatty on that album. I had these, this long period of being it occasionally connected to Warren Beatty because he, Eddie and I wrote a song for this film that then took years to get made, and I would talk to him every now and then. And I had sent him... Um, some of the songs for this album. I said, look, this is album I'm working on. He said, there was something about the, the, the bridge in that song. That he said, I think you should change that line. It sounds like um, kind of pitying and self-congratulatory. I remember I used the word self-congratulatory and I, I did change it. <laughs> <laughs> it was like not one woman beating down your door. He said, I don't, I don't like the way it sounds. So, and I did change that. But for the most part, <laughs> that that song just kind of w- was uh, just flowed right out. Now, this is a two part question, and it is what's your biggest regret in music and what's your proudest musical moment? Um, I regret that I didn't learn to play the piano, uh, but it's a regret that always has a, a flip side because I treasure my co-writing relationships so much. And I don't know if I would trade that for being able to sit there and write a whole song on my own. But, but I, I have regretted that many times over the years. I, I've also regretted not learning to read music. And I, uh, I was at a recording session once with Eddie and, and I said, hey, do you think I should learn to read music? And he immediately went, I can't think of a bigger waste of your time. <laughs> and the flip side, what is your proudest musical moment? Hmm. I don't know if I can, can pick one because they, they, they seem to come. There's one that I feel I, I'm most excited about um, in the course of doing an album. I, 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 because singing is harder for me than writing, I'm always proud when I'm able to do a performance or recorded performance on a song and it's, it's, uh, it's the way I would want the emotionally, rhythmically, sonically. Uh, I, I feel proud because it, it, it takes more doing for me to sing. This is a, f- a fun question. And it, it is, if you could go back in time and co-write with anyone of your choice, who would it be? Oh, uh, well, George Gershwin, although with apologies to Ira, who was a genius as well, <laughs> maybe he could lend me. Or Duke Ellington, with apologies to Billy Strayhorn. <laughs> <laughs> they, they could just kind of be at lunch or something, and I could, uh, I could write with those people. <laughs> who, in your opinion, are some of the best lyricists in, in, in jazz and in pop? Well, I, I, I don't really dis- distinguish in that in that way. And I would have to go back in time also, just the best lyricists in different ways. Um, Joni Mitchell, I worship as most songwriters do. Um, Stephen Sondheim is, he's without peer, literally. I I remember once being, uh, being asleep and, and something woke me up as if I'd been splashed with icy water. And, and it was uh, on PBS, I believe, but it was some sort of song. It might have been Side by Side by Sondheim, but it was, it was a, a group of people. They were singing a Sondheim piece. And it was, it was so brilliant that it just seemed to permeate my subconscious and just grab me. And I, I also remember seeing Company with my mother and Follies and just... There, there's a period of time when I, I thought I wanted to be a Broadway singer, um, which I could never be because I don't have that that kind of voice. But because I love those shows so much, I thought this is just the greatest thing I've ever experienced. And I, I didn't fully grasp at the time that it was more than anything because of Stephen Sondheim's lyrics that I became so electrified by the by these pieces. Um, 
I, I, I like Prince because it, his lyrics were so weird. Um, like uh, when doves cry, the fact that he says animals strike curious poses. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so different. Um, so I would, I would have to pick and choose o- over time. And of course, um, so many things that the Gershwins did are, are absolutely priceless. And Johnny Mercer, love Johnny Mercer. Now, you have released so many great albums. If someone heard this interview and wanted to get into your work, what three albums would you tell them to start with? I would say the Fats Waller album, New York City Drag, and Math Camp, and then something in the middle, um, maybe Ages. That was the first one that I did mostly with living writers. Because there were a couple that were a transition, I, I was using, I was either using old music on a couple of the tunes or trying my hand with my co-writers at doing something that sounded old timey, like say the early Ellington when he had the small groups. But uh, I, I, I feel as if I had something of a breakthrough when I did ages. So I would include that. You're a great songwriter. Can songwriting be learned or do you think people are born with it? I, I don't know. I'd have to see an example of somebody who couldn't write at all and then over time be, became able to do it. I think that singing can be learned it, unless you have a tin ear, which is just maybe an in, insurmountable obstacle. But I, I don't know if songwriting can be learned. Uh, I, it's hard for me to say because I don't feel as if I learned it. I, I heard a lot of songs when I was a kid. But it, in, in my case, it just kind of it w- seemed as if it was always there. And I guess my final question, it's been such a great interview. I've learned so much. If someone was interested in getting into music, what's the best advice you could give to that person? I would say listen to a lot of music. Just flood yourself with with music that you love. And go out to hear live music, which is very important. Have people turn you on to to things that they like. Certainly, whatever ability I I had when I was a kid or when I was born, the, the fact that I was surrounded by these recordings throughout my childhood, Dinah Washington and Billie Holiday and, um, Dizzy Gillespie and then, um, and later Charlie Parker, I, I, I think that that taking in as much music as you can is is very important and find what moves you the most. Wonderful. Well, the great Lorraine Feather, uh, congratulations oh, on your you. fantastic career and your latest album, Math Camp. I hope you get nominated and win some major awards. Uh, we, there's just so much. <laughs> we'll I never see. got a chance to talk about your stellar work in television, but maybe that can be for another interview. Well, everybody, the great Lorraine Feather. Thank you, Lorraine. I, I hope you had a great time on this interview, and I hope to talk to you soon. I did. I did, Nikhil. Thanks so much for uh, for doing this, and I will tell Joe that I appreciate his setting it up. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Lorraine. Have a great rest of the day. You too. Thank you so much for listening to this interview. I'm so honored to be able to talk to all of my guests. They are the best in the business. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you shared it on social media and hit subscribe for future guests. Check out NikhilHogan.com for updates on my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music, and check out SongbirdMusicAcademy.com for free resources on how to learn music. Thanks again, and I'll see you at the next show. 